Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Bioshock Infinite. Last time we had approached the factory. Now we're blowing it up. Well, first time stealing everything from every dead person on the way over. But you should expect that by now. Got hand cannon ammo. That's sort of important. Uh oh. Sounds like a turret. Luckily, it decided not to shoot at me for a while there. Long enough for me to do something about it. I guess it didn't finish it off. So let's try this again. Oh, come on. Finally. Sure was a tough one. Hm. It's actually a nice touch. I suppose he would waste an RPG just on that. What else have we got around here? Daisy said she was coming here for Fink. We need to take that elevator up. Bet it leads to Fink's office. I was going to ask which one, but apparently the choice has been made for us. Which one's better? Hmm. I barely use melee anyway. When they get up in my face, I might as well, but... You know, not all of them are dumb enough to do that. That sure are a lot of picks around here. Yeah, I was complaining about not having enough for a while there. Alright. Wow. Get prepared for the dumbest decision in all of Bioshock Infinite. Guess this is where the magic happens. Man, look at all of this. You know, it's funny. I don't think there really was a one business makes everything business back then. They're just right for each other, aren't they? Who? It's Roy and Comstock. Madeline? Mr. Lynn? My god, I... I was so set on getting to Paris, I didn't really think that... You couldn't have known this would happen. I had a role in this catastrophe. If, if you want to pretend that we're purely innocents in this, then that's your prerogative, but... You had a role in getting us to this catastrophe, but that's not really the same thing. No matter what you think. Dimensions are infinite, you know? I guess I should get that. Uh, hello? Fink? I saw you die, Booker. Saw it with my own eyes. Fitzroy. Listen, I got you your guns. I'm here for my airship. But my Booker DeWitt died for the Vox Populi. You either an imposter or a ghost. My Booker DeWitt was a hero to the cause. A story to tell your children. You... You just complicate the narrative. And I couldn't be a resurrected martyr. I couldn't help still or again. This has to end in blood. That's the only choice here. Who's missing now is the toy? And the guys on the street, they'll do exactly what you tell them to no matter what. 
despite the fact that, you know, I am a hero to the cause, people were chanting my name in the streets, so apparently either they're okay with the fact that I died for the cause and then came back, or else they aren't aware of it. And thus I don't complicate the narrative. Huh. This is the biggest decision that I don't accept in all of Bioshock Infinite. This is the other things I can accept. Catch, Mr. DeWitt. Thank you. Other things I can accept for serving the narrative, but this this doesn't serve the narrative. Yeah, electricity. But th yeah, this does not fit the narrative. This fits the game, the gameplay. And even then, it doesn't have to. Hmm. Oh, that's new. Doesn't look like there's anything else new, though. Oh, wait. Spoke too soon. And cannon bonuses. Yes. I think I saw a shotgun bonus there, too, but that'll have to wait. Oh yeah, I like that reload speed. But yeah, what the hell, Fitzroy? Just... What the hell? I mean, I guess this will make more sense a little bit later, why she betrayed us. In a, uh, plot sort of way. These holes have shown me yet another wonder, though I've yet to see the application for it. They illuminate a merger of machine and man that is somehow the lesser, yet the greater of both parties. The process seems to be irreversible. <laughs> Perhaps, though, Comstock will have some need of this kind of thing to keep watch in that tower he is building. Well, that looks painful. But then they all do. Press to wash away your enemies. Hold to grab enemies and release to reel them in for punishment. Getting into some pretty obscure use vigors at this point. All right, there's my shotgun upgrade. Looks like we're up to two for two for both of my primary weapons. Elizabeth. Okay. I wonder how many vigors you're okay. able to skip throughout the game. Booker! Oh, yeah, there's something happening way over there. And she's got good eyesight. Me, I'm just easily distracted. No! 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 Is this take your kid to work day? Why the hell was Fink's son at his office? Alright, looks like I've done some damage there with just the one... What do you call that? Possession use. Alright, there you go. Oh, hello there, fireman. Yep, there you go, buddy. Go kill some of your mates. Alright. Now, let's see here. 
Oh, hello there, friends. Sure are a lot of you around here. But I figure, you know, Skyline striking all of you would probably help. Failing that, I do have a shotgun. Man, he keeps screaming at me. But more importantly, where is he? Oh, there he is. Come on. I got your number, man. I just need to get out of here before you kill me. Oh, shit. At least I got the health before I got out of there. Where the hell is everybody else? Yeah. Oh, well, here's one of them. Two. Uh oh. What the hell? Is one of the firemen still around here? Okay, so Undertow is definitely not working against the handyman here. I can just jump get out of the way. By the way, I don't know if this is ever going to come up, but. The handy hand have this special ability, they don't really travel on the rails, but they can jump up to them and electrify them, causing you some significant damage. Yeah, I really don't know why I keep using Undertow, it's not working at all. Let's try to ram him instead. Not sure if that did a tremendous amount of damage or not. But I am in some need of a little rest. And getting the hell out of there. What the hell? Did something kill him? Because last time I was shooting at the handyman, he was still... Wait, maybe that was it. I think the Tesla ca coil got him. I was killing... I was fighting him right around here. So, yeah, I guess that must have been it. I think ramming him did a fair amount of damage, so I might try that again in the future. Man, really, nothing at all can compare to having that much more ammunition in the magazine. Anyway, there's plot that's gonna happen once I get up stairs here. I'm trying to avoid it, but here we go. Time to get this show on the road. No, no, no! She's going to kill that child. Booker, we have to do something. We have to act. We have to get in there. And it makes you wonder why she hasn't already. Come on, Booker, we've got to get out of here. Boost me up. Go to the window and distract Daisy. <laughs> Go! Also got to wonder what the hell happened to the lighting in this office. Is this it? Is this your movement, Daisy? This is what needs to be done. You see, the founders ain't nothing but weeds. Cut them down and they just grow back. If you want to get rid of the weed, you've got to pull it up from the root. It's the only way to be... <laughs> Elizabeth. I guess it runs in the family. Those are some really good scissors. I mean, really good. Uh, Elizabeth. Whoa, whoa, hey, hey, easy. Kid must have just run away. Anyway, there was one more thing I needed to find out here. Almost forgot about it. Here it is. Telescope. No, 
not really that much you can see from here. Honestly, you get a better view from that balcony up above. Oh well. Let's get the hell out of here. Well, and grab that. Only one thing to get. that he found a audio log immediately before he died. Gotta love how that keeps happening in games like this. Huh. Got our airship back. Guess that's something. Looks like they still used it as an emergency, uh, emergency hospital here, too. Imagine they had a much better use for it, too, now that the war started. Elizabeth! I know how this feels. Can't even knock on the door anymore. Oh, well. that by only twisting two of the knobs, pulling two of the levers. Elizabeth. This is all I had. Listen. How do you do it? How do I do what? Forget. How do you wash away the things that you've done? You don't. You just learn to live with it. So the moment of truth between us. New York or Paris? No, 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 no! Oh, shit. Come on, we gotta find a way to make this thing go faster. It's got into some sort of, some sort of throttle or accelerator. Do you know something. what that looks like? I Much for that airship. As Jeremiah Fink and Daisy Fitzroy die, so too ends the Vox Populi Uprising plotline. We'll certainly be seeing plenty of Vox Populi and Founder Forces as we run around through the last half of the game, third, somewhere around there. But as far as the player is concerned, the only difference from now on is the color of their uniforms. Instead, we'll be focusing on the other more personal plot, the one based around Booker DeWitt, Elizabeth, and Zachary Hale Comstock. But before we shift gears, I'd like to visit Literature Corner to... No, that won't do. Ah, there we go. We're on to Video Game Corner to analyze the plot that's ended and try to figure out why this game gets such a wide variety of reactions. The Trouble with Story Length Before I begin on Bioshock itself, I'd like to discuss the reasoning behind a criticism I've heard from several different people about the fact that the Insurrection plotline does indeed end at this point, and not at the game's ending. The thing is, not only is this not necessarily bad, it's actually pretty common, especially in long stories. Broadly speaking, there are three categories which stories fall into based on their length. 
The shortest is, of course, the short story, which can be anywhere from five to 10,000 words in length. In the middle is the novella, which is around 10,000 to 40,000 or 50,000 words. And beyond that is the full-length novel. Mind you, the numbers I just quoted are far from being definitive. Just about every English language association has its own preferred lengths, and an author doesn't really have to listen to any of them. What's more important to these categories is the nature of the story being told. A short story follows the classic conventions of storytelling that they teach you in high school. There's a rising action, a climax, a falling action, and possibly a denouement. Every aspect is a straight line, and in the ideal short story, nothing is wasted. Every action, every character, every word of dialogue, and every bit of description is completely necessary to the plot and its theme. There's simply no room for anything extraneous. If you aren't getting to the point and sticking with it, then you aren't writing a short story. In terms of the audiovisual media, short stories map to basically every TV show ever made. Sometimes they'll make things interesting with an A-B plot formula, where different characters get up to different activities at the same time. But that's simply telling two short stories which may or may not be connected. On the other hand, a novella has room to breathe and to move around. You can afford to be a little more dynamic, add some rough patches to the straight line of the rising action. That could mean subplots, side stories, an episodic format, or else simply lingering on the details and the backstory more than you can in a short story. It also means you can tell a more complex story, which goes through multiple stages that wouldn't fit together without transitions. Acts, if you will. There may even be three of them. In AV media, the novella is the film, and its predecessor the play. That's right, films and plays are only novellas. There are a few really long, far-reaching movies and a few really extended stage performances out there that you could conceivably call long-form stories. But for the most part, even long-ass three-hour epics are too short to match the girth of a full-length novel. For a true novel, the rising action isn't so much a rocky slope as it is a whole freaking mountain range. Novels are all episodic to one extent or another, not because of an author's formatting decision, but because they cover so much time and so many events that they can't all be directly connected. You can even stuff entire short stories into a novel without getting off track. That's how big they are. This is also why it's so easy to break them up into chapters, although chapters aren't a requirement to the format. Hell, some experimental modernists wrote novels without paragraphs, or even periods, mostly to prove they could. But the reason it's so difficult to translate novels into films is not only the different strengths and weaknesses of the respective mediums, it's also that essential difference in size and scope. Now here's the thing. Video games are the first AV format which can tell a novel's full story. Admittedly, you can use miniseries and continuing plot lines in television shows to tell a longer story or adapt a novel more faithfully than a film, but even so, the individual episodes have beginnings and endings more definitive than any chapter. I'll grant that it's still telling a long-form story, but a video game doesn't need to abide by any length restrictions. It can fill out exactly as much time as it needs. The player can put it down and pick it up at any point he or she wants, within certain limits, depending on how the save system works. And if they're of any respectable length, they don't expect you to finish it within a single session. These are all traits the video game shares with the novel. Of course, not all video games tell stories, and not all video games with stories are meant to be played for that reason. There are also shorter video games, like 90s-style adventure games, much like how there are short films. But at the same time, a short video game can still take an hour or two to get through, the same length as a film. The fact is that there are games which expect you to care about their characters and their events, 
And if you're creating a story for a game intended to last 10 hours or even longer, then even if most of those hours are spent killing things, you can't get by with a single rising and falling action. And even a three-act structure won't be sufficient to fill all that time. Plus, if you're clever, you can even make the fighting serve the plot instead of interrupting it. There are a lot of different ways developers are attempting to solve this problem of time. Some pack their games with side quests, short stories, that have little or nothing to do with the main plot aside from the presence of the player's avatar. Others break their game into episodes of varying sizes, from the dungeons which Link must explore in one Zelda game after another, to the individual cases of L.A. Noir. Still other games will force the plot down tangents that stray from the central goal, like the globe-trotting stories of a Final Fantasy or a Dragon Quest game, or else Bioshock Infinite's rather blatant side trip into the Hall of Heroes. Then again, a developer could also fill the time by including multiple central plots, plots which hopefully, but don't necessarily, weave together to form a single cohesive but very long story. None of these options are necessarily bad, and all of them have been used in novels both classic and hack. Gulliver's Travels is an episodic book, and if you want to see two simultaneous stories, then look no further than Lord of the Rings. Invisible Man meanders all over the place, and everything that happened at college is basically forgotten as the protagonist invests himself in Brotherhood politics. So to sum up, the fact that the story of Columbia's insurrection is over at the halfway point is not necessarily a bad storytelling decision. On the other hand, judging it on its own merits, the insurrection story is not exactly what I would call perfect. Infinite Shades of Grey As I said back in Lecture 13, Bioshock Infinite wants to be Metropolis. Just look at the character archetypes. The mad scientist who uses barely understood scientific principles to influence the plot. The rich industrialist who has no idea what it's like to live under his own rule. The influential religious leader with both a good and a bad side. The working class leader who directs the insurrection. And an extremely sheltered protagonist who has no idea what life is like outside her tower. Booker DeWitt also has a parallel, but it's not obvious until very late in the game. The plots of each are, of course, entirely different, so it's not like it's a rip-off, but the inspiration is clearly there. As far as the insurrection goes, BSI and Metropolis also have very similar themes, because this is what I take away from Bioshock. While violence may sometimes be the best solution to a problem, it is never a good solution. I've said this in the past, but force always involves destruction. It destroys wealth, destroys property, destroys people, and it even destroys the minds and the bodies of those who engage in it. That is why we had to visit the Hall of Heroes. Because fighting Slate and seeing the exhibits reinforces one of Bioshock Infinite's central themes. That said, the excuse that gets you there could have been handled better than we need a specific infusion to power a single gondola. Oh, and it turns out there are shock jockey bottles everywhere after you find the first one. However, you have to be very careful when you're trying to point out an evil inherent to humanity. You can't say that and also have black and white morality. Everyone has to be human. No one can be the villain. If there's a bad guy, then suddenly the problem isn't with our own inborn nature. The problem is the bad seed that's instilling evil into his or her minions, and the solution isn't to search within your own soul to identify and fight against the urges which can lead anyone to cause an atrocity. The solution becomes to identify the evil people who exist out there, and who can magically cause good people to do bad things against their own will. And so that's the problem with Bioshock Infinite. It's clear who the heroes and the villains are. Comstock is evil and racist and runs Columbia with an iron fist. Fink is evil and greedy and exploits the working class to a cartoonish degree that manages to outstrip the robber barons of old. 
even Daisy Fitzroy, whose side has very valid grievances, grievances which BSI pounds into us time and time again. Even she is evil and bloodthirsty because she incites the oppressed minorities into open rebellion, despite how that may have been their only real solution. And just to bring everything home, she turns on Booker, even though a resurrected martyr would have been great publicity for her side, and she even tries to shoot a kid because of who his father is. And I'm aware that her motivations are modified by the game's DLC, but it's fairly clear this was a change after the fact, so I'll talk about that when we get there. Meanwhile, you've got Booker DeWitt as a protagonist and as the player's avatar. I believe Booker's violence serves the plot by being just a little too excessive, a little too uncomfortable. Note the way Elizabeth gasps in horror every time you execute someone in front of her. The fact that violence is never a good solution while it's Booker's and therefore the player's only solution, plays into the theme that sometimes violence is necessary. And if you find that you're enjoying yourself a bit too much, Booker also faces consequences for his actions at the end of the game. Elizabeth herself reinforces the violence theme when she gets her own hands bloody, but this reinforcement is muddled because she is killing someone who is clearly evil for betraying the protagonist and trying to murder a child. We're supposed to feel as horrified as Elizabeth is by the fact that she had to murder Fitzroy. But because Fitzroy is acting like a two-dimensional villain, even acting against her own backstory, we may be cheering instead. The game is sending us mixed messages. It's possible this Fitzroy is constitutionally different from the one who threw Booker out of a Zeppelin, since we have crossed through two universes in the meantime, but I doubt this is the intended explanation. The dimension hopping is much more a part of the personal plotline, and so I'll be discussing that at the end of the game. But ultimately, the reason I think Bioshock Infinite gets such mixed reactions is because while at its heart it has a good idea and a good theme, it botched the execution. A story like this needs real, fully developed humans to tell it, something Metropolis managed by expanding on the archetypes it started with. But while many of the characters in BSI have entirely fleshed out backstories, they at times defy their own personalities to become human-shaped hammers meant to pound the thematic nail home. Irrational games reached for the moon, but all they grabbed was air. Thanks to Michael Nightingale for pointing out where I needed to explain myself better, and thank you for joining me in Video Game Corner. I hope I'll see you soon.